I'd like to introduce you to our keynote speaker. He is a Hong Kong-based entrepreneur and a national-level athlete, a former commissioned military officer for the Pakistan military, and a serious and avid extreme sportsman. He has won numerous gold and silver medals in single skull rowing and was actively involved in making Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Standard Chartered Marathon inclusive for wheelchair participants. As a side note, He's also the man behind making ATM machines accessible in Hong Kong. He holds the world record for hand cycling from Beijing to Mohe, the Chinese border with Russia, a total distance of 2,615 kilometers in 37 days. He also holds another world record for around the island race rowing competition, just to mention a few. He's a founding member of the Association for Universal Accessibility Hong Kong and serves as a board director to many prominent local organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ajmal Samuel. So, we are here today, you know. It's a wonderful kickoff to a bunch of events, the whole of November, I, I think. Yeah? So, I'm here to speak a little bit and share some of my experiences in what I have been going through in my life as well. Of course, the topic of uh, the whole theme is accessible well-being. I have twisted it a little bit and I, I've made it into accessing wellness, instead of making accessible well-being. So normally and typically when I'm invited for as a speaker, this is something entirely new to me, the whole idea of uh, accessibility and whole idea of accessing wellness. Rather, wellness is something new to me. But while I was going through and preparation and uh, preparing for this particular speech, it was just yesterday I was pre preparing for this, I real realized actually that most of the, my life struggles they resonate with this particular topic. I've never thought about it before. They resonate with it. And although it's something entirely new, what I'm trying to explain to you today, our world has changed a lot. Right now, we are going through the whole situation with COVID. And because of the COVID, of course, some of the primary and the main things which is right in the forefront of our mind is wellness and health. And we are all very cognizant and we are looking, making sure that this is something which remains relevant to us. So what exactly do we understand by wellness? The, many different people have different definitions of wellness. Okay? So some people think it's just a way, a trendy way of defining or redefining coping, which is uh, another way of putting things and redefining uh, wellness itself. I've read some, exp some experts say that having experience of health, happiness, and prosperity, that's what wellness is, okay? Others say that wellness is just mental and emotional well-being. And there are other people who would even go to the point of saying it's just a state of mind, it's a state of being. So what exactly is wellness, yeah? So from this whole learning point of view, what is wellness for me? as Ajmal Samuel, what is the wellness? So from my point of view, wellness is, uh, uh, through my whole journeys, which I'll be sharing with you today, wellness is actually a state of mind, coupled with how I manage my physical, mental, spiritual balance. It's very important. And actually, at the end of the day, it's all about how to create that balance in life midst of this completely imbalanced world. We are living in a very imbalanced world. This year is 2020 is very much relevant to that. While when I go further, I'll explain and I'll narrate a story of a young man, okay? But before I go and narrate the story of this young man, let me just uh, have a, oops. Yeah, let me just, have a narration from uh, Paolo Coelho. I'm, I'm sure all of you know Paolo Coelho. Have heard of him? When we least expect it, life sets us a challenge to test our courage and willingness to change. At such a moment, there is no point in pretending that nothing has happened 
or in saying that we are not yet ready. The challenge will not wait. Life does not look back. This particular saying is very much relevant to the story of a young man I'm going to be narrating to you in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So now let's go back to the story of this 22-year-old something. So this young man, when he was 22 years old, an army officer, he loved horses, loved to ride, loved to box, did all those things which are quintessentially military sent very active lifestyle. But something happened while he was serving in Kashmir, in the mountains in Kashmir. I'm, again, I'm sure most of you know the mountains in Kashmir as well. His jeep went into a ravine and uh, his di driver, he died instantly and he was left paraplegic. This young man who had actually had a lot of dreams, ambitions and goals and his life has just started in, in his own career. Suddenly, within a matter of seconds, everything just ended. So from his point of view, life as he knew it had just finished. It was the end of life. He didn't know. He's too young to realize that there was a lot more to life and which was waiting for him. Depression set in. Just to clarify, the I'm, guy I'm talking about is lying on the bed in the hospital, not the one in the wheelchair. Okay. So understandably, the depression set in and he was really resentful. He didn't really understand and know what is going to happen. What is, what is the future hold for him? There was restlessness. There was no peace in his life. And he had, everything was just coming to an end and he didn't know what to do and how to take his life forward. Then two things... There are many things which happened in his, the life of this young man, but there are two things which I'm going to share with you today. Two things which happened which really changed his perception and changed his uh, approach to life. So first of all, when he was in the hospital in UK, so he was in bits and pieces, he had, he had to be flown out to UK. The ward he, or the hospital he ended up in and the doctor who was looking after him was in a wheelchair himself. This is a long time ago, okay? And of course, I don't have a real picture here, so I just try to depict because back then I don't have a picture of this guy. So he himself was in a wheelchair. And all the, all the because it was a spinal care injury unit, just to give you a little background on this doctor. So this doctor, when he was 21 years of age, when he was actually going through his medical school, he was an avid mountaineer, did mountain climbing. And he had a mountain climbing accident, and he ended up breaking his back, and also ended up in a wheelchair. But he didn't stop there. So he, and he continued his education, became a medical doctor, and eventually became a spinal cord injury surgeon specialist. Okay? And he's the one who was looking after me also. So there were no excuses. The very thing, in every day, you could see him zooming up and down the wards, and up and down the hospital. Once you, that was something which I still cannot forget. It was something to behold. But at the same time, without him preaching, without him giving any lectures, without him any telling anybody, he was actually getting the message across to the people, the injured people, or the spinal cord injury, because of the spinal cord injury unit, that if we really want to, we can make anything out of our life. And th he was an example. And this is a long time ago. So he was an e really example right in front of us that we could, if we wanted to, we could make anything out of our lives. So this was the first lesson from me which I learned, which I'm going to be talking about. Second thing was when this young man actually went back home after his surgeries and all of that, of course, for him, it was a new life altogether. He didn't realize that things would be different altogether, completely different. Everything around him, his environment changes, everything changed. So he didn't know how to get around. And he would spend most of his time in his bedroom, lying and trying to figure out what to do. So the first day went by, the second day went by, and the third day, his mother told him, if you really want to get food in this house, you better come to the living room you are not going to get food in your bed, never. However cruel that might sound today, but that's another lesson which 
that parents of that guy taught him. The, basically, the lesson was, whatever the case may be, it is always possible to do things and to have an active family life. You do not need to, whatever the case may be, it doesn't really matter. A family life can still be achieved and a very healthy, active family life can be achieved. So these are two lessons which, or the two things, instant incidents which happened, which he learned from and which he really took on. So now, fast forward, I'm going to fast forward like 30 years, okay? Something 30 plus years, not 30, even 30 years. So this is that young man, okay? And sitting in front of you today. So I, I, it just, that's the, our life journey. But at the same time, I have to tell you, it was no bed of roses. Still, it is no bed of roses. There's nothing easy about life. That whole journey was not easy at all. I'm going to share with you some of the challenges which I went through and uh, which I go through on a daily basis. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit because it might come in handy. It will come in handy a little later. So with my accident, a few things changed. One of the things which really affected me big time was onset of chronic pain. So I, till today, I have chronic pain in my legs to the point that it's something like stabbing, somebody stabbing in my legs. But that time, it was so bad that I would pass out. I was sitting and talking to people and I would pass out. So what happened? The doctors put me on very heavy doses of medication and I actually ended up taking opioids, very heavy op opioids. If, those who, if there's any medical professional here, I was on almost like six, 700 milligrams of opioids every day. That's massive, okay? You can kill a horse with that uh, much of opioids. So, uh, to the point you can say that that was a medical addiction, not a social addiction, but a medical addiction. I had to take it because my body, I thought my body needed it, so I want, I had to continue taking so much high uh, medication. But at the same time, some of the other, another challenge was my full life was full of rejections. You name it, every type of rejection because the situation, because things just weren't right. I hadn't figured out life and it was just a matter of things weren't going in my favor. So now let's talk about how I managed to access wellness, okay? How I managed to actually get to a point where from those challenges to the point where life became easy or became to the, to the point that life became comfortable. I wouldn't say easy, but life became comfortable for me and to the point that where I enjoy life, not to the, that to all those challenges, but today as I enjoy life. And I think uh, from, a, a, from a human being perspective, it is a right for everybody that we are entitled to that balance, to that opportunity where we can balance our wellness. It is important. It is entitlement of human beings as such. And another th very important thing that we are all, we do not realize, but we are all capable of doing it. Okay. In my case, just look at me. In my case, and going through all the challenges, and believe me, I haven't even mentioned. This is just tip of the iceberg. I haven't told you a lot of the things which I go through and I've gone through. So, it is possible, and we are entitled, and we are all capable of doing it. So what is it that actually made me get to the point that I went on this stage where I managed to access wellness and excelled in my life? So in the early 2000s, early 2000s, I ended up becoming the CEO of a Hong Kong company, uh, CityLine. Some of you might know, some of you might not know. Okay. That is the time I was it's a typical Hong Kong life, full of stress, full of challenges, no sleep, morning till evening, you're working, 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 working. And just imagine, just go back to the point where I was actually living with opioids. So at the same time, I was trying to excel in my career as well. It came to a point that I started feeling that I I'm not clear in my head. I'm feeling foggy and I'm feeling, I, I had issues, health issues. I was getting obese. It's a fact. 
might, might not look today, but getting obese, health issues, not feeling anxiety, and all those things, all those things which come with not having a good health were chasing me, okay? So I went to the doctor and I told my doctor, my pain specialist, hey, I think I've got all these symptoms and I've, I'm feeling foggy, I'm not clear in my head and I really, I love my career and I want to excel in my career and I want to make sure that I don't get pulled down by my, all of this stuff, so what should, I, what should I do? My doctor told me, well, you've been on this medication for most of your life and stopping it today will is dangerous because you might have a seizure or a, or a stroke or a heart attack or whatever and so you cannot stop this medication well me being me and stubborn and uh, stupid maybe do both together i went back home and uh, i started doing a lot of research and i decided that i'm going to do a cold turkey and i'm going to stop everything and during my research i found something that what is the replacement of morphine, okay, or replacement of opioids? And the ho there's a, I'm just mentioning one drug, but they were, there's a whole cocktail of drugs I was on. So what's the replacement of all of that? So it keep on consistently coming back to me in my research that is endorphin. But how do I get endorphin? The question was, how do I get endorphins? Of course, I don't want to be on another chemical just to replace one chemical and physically taking pills or whatever. That was not the case. That was not my point. So uh, again, you know, I've mentioned to you earlier that I was a very active, physically active, young army officer back when I was 22 years of age or 20 years, 22 years of age when I had my accident. So I started thinking maybe I should get back into that mode and I should start getting really physically active rather than just that would be really the ideal because endorphins, that's the m most appropriate way to get endorphins back into your system. So those of you who know, I'm sure everybody's from Hong Kong, they, you know Boyne Road, okay? I, I just happened to live somewhere near Boyne Road and that was the beginning and the start of my journey. So in my wheelchair, in this particular wheelchair, not this one, but something similar to it, a normal wheelchair, every morning I started going to Boyne Road. You know how many kilometers Boyne Road? Anybody knows how many kilometers Boyne Road? Four and four, yeah? So four kilometers going up and four kilometers coming back. So that was my daily routine and believe me, everything hurt. My body hurt, my lungs hurt, my arms hurt, everything was hurting. I couldn't even wheel myself for 4K and 4K down. But I didn't stop. I kept going at it. And eventually, I ended up investing. I said, okay, now I'm getting to the point that I'm actually getting fitter and fitter. So what do I do? So I started investing in some equipment and I bought a special wheelchair for uh, taking part in marathons and taking part in triathlons. And I even invested in getting a hand bike so I can start uh, doing hand biking also basically participate in triathlons. So what started off in Boyne Road as a short journey, 4K, 4K, ended up me participating in a lot of marathons and triathlons, biathlons, including half Ironmans. I'll give you a story of a half Ironman in a second. Even I started doing other things like ro rowing, scuba diving, or maybe 2007. I started competing in uh, Ironmans and the most prominent at that time, most prominent Ironmans or half Ironmans were happening in Singapore. So that event, it was 1.9 kilometers swimming, 90 kilometers biking and 21.1 kilometers running. Okay. So a total 113 kilometers of, uh, in one go. So my first Ironman, half Ironman, I book my ticket, I take my equipment, and I give myself five days, and I say, okay, I'm going to go to Singapore, I'm going to participate, and on the f Thursday, I'll go there, Friday, I'll have my day resting, and Saturday, I'll check in my equipment, they need to, you to check in to their venue, and then on Sunday morning, I'll do the Ironman, and then a rest, and Monday, I'll come back to Hong Kong. So, it's 
me being ideal. I studied, I took part in the Ironman. I finished it and actually finished it very well. I went back to my hotel room. I went to sleep and I, when I woke up, my fingers were swollen like this. My uh, arms were swollen like this. I, I didn't even know. I, I was in excruciating pain. And that those five days ended up being in a week in Singapore in, in the hotel, just resting in the hotel. But that also gave me an understanding that, okay, that 4K where I started and doing all this exercise to the point where I am doing half Ironmans, even that is not easy. But I stayed put. I start continued doing these type of trainings. And at the end, about three years later, 2009, I think 2009, I still remember. It's something which makes you feel good. It, my routine became, because there were a lot of competitions happening in, in Singapore, but for Aviva, one, of my, one or two times I did that. My office didn't know I was doing this at that time. So on Friday night, I would go to Singapore, Saturday check-in into my, the whole equipment, Sunday morning, wake up three o'clock or so, do the half Ironman, Sunday afternoon, three o'clock flight, take back to Hong Kong and be in Hong Kong. It was a huge change from that 4K, which I was doing in, on Boyne Road. So it came to, the fitness came to that point. So now, and I, I never ever imagined that this, person like me would actually end up doing so many endurance things. So I, I already talked about scuba diving. I'm certified deep water scuba diver. To the point that I actually ended up started rowing again. The place where I come from originally where I was born and all that, there's no concept. I, I have no idea about rowing. But I ended up single skull rowing and I ended up being on Hong Kong team and representing Hong Kong to the point that I was actually picking up medals for Hong Kong in the para rowing team. Okay. Uh, what you see at the bottom is from uh, 2009 when I actually, in the Iron, half Ironman also, I, at, in 2009 I think I, my team was uh, uh, first in Asia. We were, yeah, first in Asia at that time. So actually, all of this experience changed my life completely. The mental well-being, the spiritual well-being, the physical well-being, it translated into this whole physical exertion and exercise translated into that particular well-being in my body, which translated into me being a happy person, me being a more productive person. And I also saw that suddenly that fogginess and that slowness in thinking that slowly disappeared. And now I was not on any medication. Till today, I'm not on medication. I have chronic pain. I still have chronic pain. But my medication is endorphins, not morphine. That's completely different. So this is uh, Harsha men mentioned. So I also uh, was the first uh, disabled crew and actually in 2017 and 2019, in 2019, the first 100% disabled crew to participate in the Round the Island Rage, which is really grueling, and uh, we finished it. We finished it in seven hours, non-stop rowing in seven hours around Hong Kong waters. And then this is something else which I took on, on last year. I biked from uh, Beijing, and I ended up in Mohe, and, uh, which is a border town with Russia. And but my first time, I was I actually I don't know if you guys realize that there's tundra in the northern China. So I was biking on the tundra in northern China, and it took me 37 days to bike from Beijing to Mohe. So now coming to the current days today, as we we are faced with this huge challenge of COVID-19, prof being professional sportsmen or being endurance sport athletes or even people, average physically fit person, it's a very good excuse. I'm not going to do anything because of COVID-19. People take it, people use this as an excuse. Oh, I'm not going to do anything with COVID-19. But I'm, and I'm out of practice from rowing right now because officially the government doesn't allow the rowing to happen and so I can't row. But I made it a point, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to train every day and I till today I'm training and I'm taking I'm doing my 
hand biking and I have a goal that I'm going to bike at least 1,000 kilometers every month. Okay. And up till today, up till now actually, uh, I started this in March, April. I've done about 8,500 kilometers this year. Okay. So this is from August, this is from uh, September. So basically, the gist of what I'm trying to get the message across to you is, when we talk about wellness, when we talk about active well-being of ourselves, it is, it is all up to us. We are in it. We are part of the equation. Okay? And of course, there are people around us as well. But both put together, that's where we can make a difference. And you know, at the end of the day, it's about us ourselves. We have to make this change. We have to bring this change about so that we can get active. And the, the recipient is ourselves. There are four things which I want to impress upon you, which you need to really take back from what I, my life is all about and my journey of my life. So first of all, be committed to yourself. Let yourself, that you deserve, let yourself know that you deserve to be well and balanced and happy. Be selfish, but in a good way. Second, find something that you want to do, be it yoga or art or meditation or endurance sports or something even more simple like reading, listening to music. Find your own passion to find your balance in life. Third, remind yourself that you're not alone. It's very important. That there are, there's a community of people who will be your biggest cheerleaders, but only if you let them into your life. This could be a family, close friends, even strangers, and organ or organizations like Yama. This is a life journey that needs companionship, so seek it out. Fourth, there will be obstacles. This is not easy, but it's not impossible. No matter what the circumstances, external, like COVID, or internal, like injuries, believe me, I have tons of injuries, okay? Always think that there's a solution. And that's already the battle which is won. I think that's it. That's how I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you very, very much.